Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Open Forum podcast. Today we have with us Gus Fraser. Gus is uh, the CEO of Block and Revoke as well as working in uh, cybersecurity, software engineering and data privacy. Uh, has many, many years of experience and that's why we're here today. We're here to talk about our privacy technology, uh, big tech, ad tech and all those lovely buzzwords you hear a lot about but it's not very tangible so we're hoping that that Gus can make it a little bit more real for us and uh, give us a little bit more insight as to why this is something that we should care about but but Gus thank you very much for being here um why don't you take a couple minutes introduce yourself and then we'll just go from there sure thanks Sonny so um I'm Gus Fraser I run a company called Revoke and we specialize in building uh, privacy and security apps predominantly to help uh, consumers started off uh, round about the time that GDPR came out, which you hopefully would have heard of, that afforded more rights to uh, citizens, individuals in the EU, or even individuals targeted by uh, companies outside the EU, to allow them to have more control of their data. So we built some products around that, um, because the law on its own uh, is kind of meaningless without tech. So we believe they go hand in hand. You can have the law there that says you've got right to access your data, but the, the the platforms, the tech needs to exist for you to actually exercise those rights. So that's what we've been concentrating on for the last few years, for the last four years. Um, Revoke is about taking back control of your data, sending subject access requests, finding out what breaches you've been in, and really just having a little bit more ownership of this ever-growing digital footprint. So we're leaving trails everywhere we go. Every time we spend money on our card or use our phone or you know, our email inboxes are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this giant cloud of personal data is getting uh, more out of control every day. So we believe that it's important to limit that. And we give people the tools to help them manage that. Okay. You, you mentioned um, a couple of different things there. Now, with us going and buying stuff here, there and everywhere with our cards, with us going everywhere on the internet, we're leaving behind a lot of trails, a lot of breadcrumbs, a lot of cookies. Now, this is also something that people will have heard of. And now, because of that uh, GDPR laws that, that you've already mentioned, is something that every website you visit, they now have to uh, give you the information. And most people just hit accept. They, they see that pop up and they go onto a website, whether it's the BBC or whatever else it might be, Amazon, uh, Facebook, whatever, they're just going to hit accept what is it that that's doing so as you mentioned um one of the things that you guys do with revoke is it gives you the ability to check where your data has been essentially so how is it that those two things marry up well first of all you mentioned the cookie banners which um i read something interesting called consent fatigue because it's something where you see the banner and you just click okay get me to the service i'll click on anything i'll accept anything and nobody really reads those terms and conditions no one reads the privacy policy so what we're doing is we've we're, we're creating a faux sort of we, we it looks like we're helping people to make choices but we're not because we're just helping them to make the default choices which most of the time are technically illegal. So what I mean by that is there are dark patterns, which a dark pattern is when you're encouraged to hit the green button instead of the neutral one, um, or other ways of encouraging people to click in certain places. And it's well known um, over the years, these, these techniques have been perfected to get people to buy things. And you, know, you can say that's fair enough in an e-commerce situation, but when you're always encouraged to hit okay on the banner, in the green, the big green button, without even checking what they're recording, then um, you're, you're sort of creating this um, situation where it appears as though we're giving people choice, but we're not really. We're forcing them down this route where we're saying that anything you do on this website, we could share with other websites, and that's why people get followed around the internet after they search for something on one site, and then all of a sudden they're getting bombarded with ads for the same thing in their email and on other websites. So the cookie banner thing, I think, has been a failure, um, even though it's meant to give you the choice. There are the vast majority of organizations do not comply with the neutral and uh, opt in perspective that you should be given. So you should not be the OK button should not automatically sign you in. You should actually have to opt in to 
um, accepting your data could be shared. And there are many reasons why you might want that to happen. So I don't mind in some cases sharing what I'm doing on a website, but in some cases I don't. But if I automatically go, click OK, the default option, the majority of times I will be opting into sharing my data without really having considered what that consequences might be. What are those kinds of consequences, though? Because this is this still feels a little bit nebulous for for those that aren't familiar. Clicking OK and having you know, I looked at something on Amazon and then it pops up when I'm on Facebook. Yeah, what's sure. the deal? So there's a few uh, direct risks, I suppose, and some sort of slightly more indirect ones. But um, let's say I go shopping for something on Halloween. Um, so it's a one time purchase I'm going to buy for that one year. And that's it. I'd never want to deal with that shop again and buy that wig again or whatever it might be, you know. Um, so they have my data and then they've got it forever now uh, after that one purchase. Now, uh, they I might want to, you know, I, there's no reason in my mind that they should continue having that data. Um, so they're at risk. They're a, probably a small retailer at risk of data breaches. So they've got my card payment details. They've got my home address because they ship something to me. They've got my email address. They've got my first name and last name. You know, that's, that's a fair amount of data that could easily be breached. And they're probably using some kind of WordPress or Shopify, cheap storefront or whatever. They're probably not internet security experts. There's probably a fair risk. And there have been many instances of e-commerce uh, sites that have been breached. So that's a risk to me because my data is out there and I didn't delete it or there was no easy mechanism for me to delete um, the data. I just clicked accept. Um, so they might I might have accepted that they share that data somewhere else, which maybe in the grand scheme of things, you know, this guy bought a wig. So, so what? It's no big deal. What about um, weather apps, though? So I might have an app on my phone and it's a weather app and it's got beautiful pictures and we had a big storm last night. So it might have might have depicted it really graphically. And, and that might be the reason I use the weather app. But 99 percent of weather apps don't employ meteorologists. They're just using a meteorologist service and then they're actually selling your data. Um, they, the terms and conditions and the privacy policies in most weather apps are about tracking your location data because most people are too lazy to say, well, this is where I am right now. They'd rather have location services on on their phone so that they can lazily go, uh, oh, this is the weather where I am right now, even though most people don't actually travel outside a, a very big radius on their day to day. So instead of having location services on, you should um, you should actually just tell the app what location you want to look the weather up for. So these weather app companies, they are employing um, salespeople to sell that location data because location data is quite valuable, but people don't realize this. So everywhere I go, there's only one person that goes from my house to my office every day, every weekday or most weekdays, and that's me. So with that data, I can work out who people are. It's not anonymous at all. And it's the same reason that um, whilst people think that location is anonymous, my Danish manufactured headset um, by a company called Jabra, or Danish owned at least, is sending my location to China every time I use it. Now, that seems a bit odd to me, um, and it shouldn't be allowed. And I'm pretty sure that their claim will be that, well, it's anonymous, but it's not really, because every time I use my headset, which is every time I go anywhere, my location's been leaked. And all of that information should be in the privacy policies, and all that information should be obvious for us to decide whether or not we do want to use that service. But unfortunately, it's all hidden in legalese, and that's why nobody reads them. And that's why cookie banners and privacy policies are do not help consumers make informed decisions. You mentioned something there towards the end about the data not being anonymous. Now, for the average Joe, they think to themselves, ah, uh, it's my location data, yeah, but this is an app. I haven't maybe given that app my name or my details or whatever. So so far as that person is concerned, it, it is anonymous. It's just a weather app or it's just, uh, Instagram does have your name, but pick an app. Um, one, how is it not anonymous? And two, has that been exploited before? Yeah, there was a scandal a few years back of, of of this kind of stuff, but yeah, it's um, so with the if I knew everywhere you'd been, I could pretty much work out where you live. That's obvious because uh, there'll be one kind of hotspot in that data set. So, and then once you work out someone's address, 
it's pretty straightforward to work out what their first name, last name is, who lives at that address. Um, there are many other data sets out there like, I mean, I'm not saying you can work it out just from that data set, but correlating it with other data is, is pretty straightforward. There was an excellent series in the New York Times about three years ago, I think, and they'd got hold of a bunch of location data and they'd identified loads of people in that particular um, data set. And that is, for me, a gross invasion of privacy, the fact that somebody knows everywhere I've been. Um, I just I just think that that uh, shouldn't be so easy for someone to find that out. Uh, Google used to have a um, a history, which I don't think is now available anymore in the in the EU, at least, because they were tracking everywhere you go because they thought it might be useful for you. But then they know everywhere I've been, like literally down to the, you know, to the street address of every place I've been, um, you know, 24-7. Um, and and I just think that's wrong, you know, and can it be exploited was your question. Um, yeah, I mean, there are some, there have been some cases where it's been exploited to the detriment of the, you know, the, the US military operations in Afghanistan, because the soldiers were running around with Strava on, and it was obvious where the camp, where the base camps were. So, I mean, that's a fairly extreme example, but it's just one of people not really paying attention to what their location data is doing. Um, what, when, I mean, I live in a fairly safe place. Um, but if someone has my location data, they can know when I'm home and when I'm not home. That's a pretty that's a that's a pretty useful information for anyone who might be wanting to break into my house, for example. And the other side of the coin is you mentioned the New York uh, Times piece. It sounds like yeah, you know, they did something a bit um, insidious by getting people's location data. But actually, this is something you and I can freely do. It's not something we have to go to the dark web for, right? No, it's for sale. You can buy, there are data brokers out there who harvest this data, who buy it from the app makers. So the app makers who retrieve, who get the data from, let's say, weather apps, and they will buy those data sets and then they will sell them on again. And there's a whole industry about that, particularly in the US. In the EU, I mean, the, the the problem generally lies in the debate as to whether or not it's personal data or not. When it's just an individual, no first name, no last name, just the location data, um, it's not treated with the sensitivity that I think it should be in the EU and in, in any sort of legal context, which means that it's uh, – it, well, this is why an EU headquartered company is – happy presumably to send location data to to china and if you think about the number of fines that google has uh, had from within the eu and outside the eu the the u.s and loads of fines in the u.s as well for abuse of personal data um this is in a more regulated environment than china for example so you can just imagine that what's going on with any data that's being captured by chinese companies like baidu or in russia yandex they they are the equivalents to Google, to the Googles of the Western world, uh, but operating in a far less regulated environment. So you can imagine what they are doing. I mean, I can't imagine that they are being fined by their own authorities there. Um, it, it's more like we are telling those um, those companies and their governments everything we're doing. Literally, because one of the things we haven't touched on yet is uh, it's a very well-known fact. Uh, Facebook admitted it within a court case that everything you say and do uh, is is listened to. Uh, they have people actually listening to your conversations. Your data is downloaded and there's someone sitting in an office, God knows where, who's listening to you. And that's one of the reasons why when you were talking about buying the Buzz Lightyear Halloween costume, it popped up despite the fact you'd never Googled it and the only time Buzz had been on was on your TV, right? Yeah, I mean, um, you, you you mentioned something quite scary and quite spooky um, in the sense that Facebook and Meta's ad admission that people are monitoring everything that's going on. And um, the San Francisco, I think it was, police partnered with a company who believed they could predict crimes. Now, this is a very recent kind of uh, article I read, I think it was at the weekend. Um, and, you know, this is, we're, we're not far off a dystopian kind of future where people are being arrested or even investigated for crimes they haven't committed based on some biased algorithm that is trying to, trying to supposedly keep, keep us all safer. Like the um, precox but, from Minority Report. Basically. Well, it's exactly that, isn't it? You know, but I didn't realize it would be so soon, but it literally is happening right now under our noses. 
Um, luckily, there are some great organizations out there like Electronic Frontier Foundation who do a lot of work to try and combat these sort of things. But um, the, my worry is the apathy about privacy in general, because uh, if the, the the larger the data sets you have, then um, the more accurate models you can build. And obviously some the, the big AI superpowers, if you like, would be the US and China. And there is actually a, a really good book by Kai Fu Li, who was the first Google, he ran Google China, and then he, he went off to um, do some other things, including writing a fantastic book called The Rise of the AI Superpowers. I think that's what it's called. It's about AI superpowers anyway. And the conclusion is really that China is going to win this war because they've got unfettered access to so much data. Um, there's been a lot of ch chat about AI, chat GPT, for example. Uh, recently, it's a very, very hot topic. Um, but all of those models, all that data, ev ev everything in the AI world needs a lot of data, can never have enough data. And the more data you've got, the more accurate your models, and the more things that you can build and predict. And uh, we're just giving this stuff away. So um, that's another thing that I think we we should be aware of. You know what what the the value of it. It's kind of like the it's not just the value, the the individual value of our actions and activity and and what we're doing. Um, but why should big tech be making all this money out of us? Um, you know, I just I just don't think that I, I just don't believe that it's almost like the injustice side of it as well. Like what? Why should big tech make all this money out of everything that I'm doing? There's got to be some sort of trade-off. And maybe it is that the service is free, but I want the choice. You know, mm. I would rather pay for my Elon Musk style blue tick and be sure that I was never tracked and that every choice that I was making was um was a informed. genuine choice. Yeah. Mm. Yes, exactly that. And some people wouldn't. And then there you've got the risk of a two-tier class where you've got the people who can't afford to pay for it, so they pay for it with their data. And you've got the people who can afford to pay for it and they remain private. That's an interesting aspect that I never actually considered. Um, the fact that you'd have that, that two-tier element to the society. Because it's I um, I'm a firm believer that if you're not paying for it you're the product and also if you believe in the product you should be able to put a, a couple bucks to it what's the difference of not buying a couple extra cups of starbucks if that means your data is going to be private but one of the things that you mentioned with the whole ai aspect is that the more data that's collected the more accurate that data can be and one of the things that you alluded to earlier on uh, with regards to they make the accept button green so that you're more likely to click it. They're influencing behavior. There's these nudges. That's also something that we're not seeing that's being done by the algorithm of every website, even something as simple as a Google search. The algorithm itself uh, is being written in such a way that our choices on these websites are also being manipulated. So not only is it a case of with more information, they can make things more accurate, but with more information, they can also bias our choices uh, to the extent that there was an experiment run by, I can't remember the fella's name. He was on the Joe Rogan experience. They'd done an experiment to see if they could manipulate people's voting habits and voting choices. Uh, and they can, fl I, I think it was around one or two percent or something, a significant enough number that it could have changed the outcome of some uh, elections. And this is exactly what Facebook were doing. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't so much what Facebook themselves were doing, but they were facilitating it. So, one of my uh, good friends and, and board advisors, Brittany Kaiser, was the Cambridge Analytica. Analytica. Yes. And yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So, the way that she would talk about it is that she would say that um, you've got, You've got people on the fence, so you you could convince them to vote one way or another. But if they are people who you do not who aren't voting in the way that you would like them to, you convince them not to vote because that's easier than getting them to to change. So they they had access to this. They were basically exploiting uh, people's data. And just you're right about when you search for something, then it's influencing the algorithm already. And the the easiest example I've got of this is um, my daughter's messed up my Spotify 
uh, algorithms because she'll search for music that I don't generally listen to if if I'm not in the car with her or whatever. Oh, fantastic! Um, <laughs> and and she's she's hoping that she messes up my sort of Spotify Wrapped end of year and one of her artists will pop up in it and you know that's her goal. So yeah, absolutely. The more that you you know the more you search play in Spotify as a simplistic example, the more it's going to be tuned. And actually, for most use cases, that's fantastic because you are looking for things similar to other things that you like already. So that's good. Um, but then you have this kind of risk of everything becoming a bit of an echo chamber and a bit of a well. I'm only going to see the news that actually that that um, that is aligned with my beliefs, for example. So I'm only going to see. And this was the thing: is that during that period, Cambridge Analytica were actually pushing ads for news that really made people um, want to vote in a particular way or to not vote, and that's a very real risk to democracy. So, you know, what's worse than that? Not much. Wasn't it targeting people's emotions and by driving anger, you, you tend to have yes, a more absolutely. more of a response? Because, right, right, exactly. So um, people go, well, that wouldn't happen to me. I'd, I would definitely wouldn't, uh, wouldn't swing my vote. And so I'm fine with it, you know, but actually you'd be surprised how people get angry. I mean, they call it, what do they call it? Doom scrolling. People who yeah. will you know, scroll through the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the Twitter, and, you know, even LinkedIn to a certain extent. And I was, um, one of my colleagues mentioned on Friday, we, we, uh, he was actually just, he's, he's moving away. Uh, so we had to leave and drinks and we were talking about, um, the addiction of social media platforms and how they're designed to keep you hooked and everyone's got their vices and what have you. And, uh, he, he he couldn't believe that I said, well, actually, if there's one I'm hooked on, it's probably LinkedIn. He couldn't believe it. He's like, it's a load of rubbish, though. But everyone's view is so um, tuned, you know, towards, like, I've collected, curated, a, a, a guess, the content, for me, is usually fascinating. It's people who are talking about things I'm interested in talking about. And for him, it's very, very different. It's a load of, it's, it's a load of rubbish, he says. He can't, you know, it's full of influencers trying to tell him how to how to make it big on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, so we have a very different lens on these things, a different algorithm. The algorithm is is trying to make it, obviously it's not working for him, but um, these sort of platforms, they are designed to keep you hooked. You know, there it's the attention, it's the fight for attention, isn't it? So um, it's not surprising that they try and curate and, and manipulate content tiktok's probably the, the the best worst example if you like they're you know people are hooked on that and they're sort of doom scrolling but imagine if you're on tiktok for example and and the every you know it's meant to be for entertainment but just by subtly adding in some angry uh videos or some things about injustice or something like some that you protests know, some going on in a land and then you see something that you strongly disagree with all of a sudden you're going to start to get a little bit upset about it and it's going to change your mood and potentially could change your the, your your maybe your attitude towards voting so you know they've they've i'm not saying that um i mean the algorithm is designed to keep you interested and you know who do we point the finger at a big tech is there to make money um like apple who claimed, you know, what do they say? Privacy, that's iPhone. Privacy but, is yeah, our policy, yeah. Fine. It was only 8 million euros by the French authorities, but it would be, it's impossible in my mind that this could have happened if they had a real culture of privacy. They're in it, they're in the game too. And the game is to make as much money as they can. They're the biggest company by market cap in the world. You don't get there by accident. You get there by intentionally trying to make as much money as you can everywhere you possibly can. If they had a real pri privacy culture, so many people would have called out what they were doing. It would have been so obvious to people working there and it would have been stopped. So um, just because they claim privacy, for me, I mean, it's it's laughable, really. They try and do, they get away with what they can get away with. And it's the same with Meta and Alphabet, Google and what have you. They do what they can until they get fined. And if they get fined... It doesn't matter. It's no. built into their policies and how much money they're making. It's like the pharma companies, when they create a drug, they build into the price of the drug, whatever the fine's going to be five, 10 years down the line. It's the same thing with big tech. They know they've got it put away in a kitty stash somewhere, surely. Yeah. But Agreed. they, they, 
they obfuscate the laws and they use euphemisms as to what they're doing with regards to their tracking um or they just keep it hidden away so far into the settings that no one will ever actually come across it um and one of the other things that you mentioned is that you know apple didn't get there by accident neither did google neither did amazon and neither did facebook the the thing all these companies have in common is they collect all this data yeah they're probably sharing it with the chinese government too but they have a lot of funding from the us government as well and more than likely the uk government more than likely other governments as well but we know for a fact that all of these companies from incutel have had some sort of funding to help them and part of that deal is the fact that they share the information with these uh, uh, three-letter agencies because that also gets around the laws. So the the CIA has found a way of being able to collect data without collecting data because they got it from Apple, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've uh, I would say I wouldn't say firsthand, secondhand experience of the desire of all of the those um, security agencies to have full access to everything. Um, every now and then, Apple will come out with a story to go, look, we're not giving the data away. It's going to compromise privacy. And there'll be a bit a sort of big public spat. But, you know, behind the scenes, pretty confident that there's a that that um, there is a lot of pressure being put on them. Um, I know that during COVID, we developed uh, an app for helping people to prove that they could meet the criteria of a physical space like an airplane or building and we had a successful pilot in miami with a, one of the big four um and it was about answering the question that was being posed without giving up your privacy so for example when you get to the building um you need to scan a code and the code is going to ask you do you meet this criteria and it's called a zero knowledge proof where there is no way that you have to give up your first name last name date of birth health records did you have a covid test a vaccine um what sort of test was it when was it or have you had COVID within a certain period? There's a set of rules that govern whether or not that that company was happy to let you in or not. And you do not need to then say, here is my COVID test, here's my date of birth, here's everything else. It's just a yes, no. And if you meet the criteria, it's a green tick. And so we built this tool with the, with a layer kind of encryption that would mean that it's not possible for anyone to exploit the system. And certainly not with today's computing power. But at one point, there were security services wanting to know uh, about this. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it is happening. It is happening. One of the more, I think, insidious aspects is that we've spoken about location data pretty thoroughly. And that's actually something that's almost impossible to turn off to the point of, even if you turn your phone off, if we take iPhones, for example, they become an air tag and they can still communicate through Apple's mesh network so that even if your phone is off and if you have an iPhone, they can still see where you are. It's still bouncing off other pieces of equipment around you, whether it's a mobile phone or something else, and it will send its location data. So at all times, you're being tracked and it begs the question, why do they need all of this data? Because not all of it is going to be relevant for you to sell ads, ad space for, right? Yeah, I mean, the, we we are carrying around surveillance devices on us. Um, yeah, and we, we've uh, opted into that, you know. Um, the theory of there's a chip in the vaccine for, uh, in, in, in the shot for me, we've already got a chip in our hands. Like there's, there's no well, need for someone to... Yeah. Well, exactly. You know, um, and we did this. Uh, we we we've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, it's only been re relatively recently that both Apple and Google have in have made app, app developers comply to a certain extent. Now we build apps and we get rejected every now and then for misunderstandings, mostly by uh, Google or by Apple, actually about whether we've clearly enough stated what we are doing and sometimes we're not doing what they think we're doing there are levels of um they are reviewing apps more carefully than they used to 
Uh, but it's not that long ago that you could build an app that was um, capturing everything, you know, that had access to your camera, had access to your microphone. And so people used to believe that their phone was listening to them. And uh, I used to play this game with my kids who were quite young at the time, but they're 12 and 14 now. But we've still never seen the ad that we we basically talked about getting a, a tropical fish or a goldfish Um just talked about it verbally every time we remember you know it's a joke we're not actually going to get one but we want to wait and see where did the ad when did the ad stop popping up mm. um to see whether or not we have been listened to because i've never searched for goldfish or fish or anything like that i've been careful not to and it, and it's not happened um but i have had those situations where i've had an uncanny ad that's just ridiculous so the situation was that i'd been walking for i don't know two three hours and I got home and I sat down and I can't remember what I was going to shop for, but the first thing that popped up was a foot spa. Now I would never dream in a million years of looking for a foot spa. I just wouldn't, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I just, it's just not something that I've ever looked for. Absolutely no connection whatsoever. But at that moment in time, I thought that would probably be quite nice right now, but I'm not going to buy it. Now, how did they know that? Is it because my phone was moving around at a walking pace for a certain period pretty sure it was because there's no other explanation i can find for it they used my location data they used the whatever movement on my phone and decided he's probably been walking quite a long time maybe we can get him to buy this thing it's amazing it the levels to this there there are levels to this to to what they're doing and and how they're doing it, how they're managing to manipulate every element of every little drop of data that they're getting. It, it, it's phenomenal. Like I, I yeah. have to applaud it. I, I yeah, yeah. Oh, for, I'm fascinated, you know, and that that's before we even get into like ad fraud and, and then the amount of, you know, is ad tech the biggest fraud that's ever been committed? I mean, we've got meta and alphabet are predominantly ad funded organizations but yet they don't ever have any actual responsibility to prove that they showed the right ad to the right people i think that they definitely sometimes show them to the right people there's no doubt about that but there were some studies done that showed that some that somebody put an ad and they wanted to target a particular gender tar- wants to target women and they conducted a survey and they found that about 50% of the respondents were actually men who had seen the ad. So, you know, how accurate is it? Um, so who's going to, who, who's benefiting with the ad fraud? I mean, ads tech for sure, um, but it's at the cost to the advertisers and to, to a certain extent to consumers seeing irrelevant ads. Um, and got to wonder where this is going because since Facebook, uh, since Meta got that fine a couple of weeks ago from the EU, uh, interestingly, it was more about the e-privacy directive and not GDPR. But anyway, they um, they are going to have to change their ways. They were given three months to give people the uh, to give their users. They must be able to opt in and opt out of targeted advertising. Um, so how is that going to affect their revenues? Uh, if you can't convince an advertiser that you can reach the right person, because a lot of people have decided to opt out of being of, of personalized ads then you're, you're you're not going to be very effective at selling that advertising space anymore. So um, I think that's going to have a dramatic impact on users, um, on Meta itself. And um, they're just going to try and find more ways to skirt the law and and encourage people to, or claim rather, that people have actually opted in to this um, personalized advertising. Well, I can see a way for them almost immediately to to sort that out to work in their favor. If I'm uh, if I'm Zuckerberg or the guys responsible for this, one relatively easy way about it is all those people that opt out, give them absolute shite on their feed to the point where they're fed up and they'd rather the targeted stuff. And again, it's manipulation. Yep. But I don't no care. doubt about it. Yeah, I mean, we used to get some really, you know, the ads used to be far less targeted. Um, but I still, you know, I still contest, I still believe that this ad tech has been based on, you know, they've been, <laughs> I'm pretty convinced that a lot of it has been, 
they, they have not been able to present the right ads to the right people. So as an advertiser myself, I mean, we do put ads out there and we do use some of these platforms and we, you know, we, we want, we want to work out how to reach certain people. Who's the rest, best person to install and use our apps. Um, and I'm still convinced because they don't really have any, you know, you assume as an advertiser, you assume that if no one clicks on your ad, it's a terrible ad or you've targeted the wrong people. You never assume that they just showed it to the wrong person. Um, so like when when I look at Google, what Google thinks they know about me, Google thinks I like, amongst other things, country music and cats. Now, both of those two things are lies. You know, I, it's not that I hate cats. It's just that I would never look for anything to do with cats and country music. I love music, but that's right down at the bottom of my likes in terms of music. So it sounds some... like they've confused you with my missus. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a funny one because I use it as an example because it means that someone out there is trying to sell cat foods to a cowboy or something <laughs> and they, and I'm getting to see the ad and it's, and it's like, <laughs> And it's not me. And I ain't buying that ever, you know? So someone's wasted the advertising money on me. How did that even happen? Um, I mean, that's just one example. There's got to be loads more examples. That's just the one that, you know, about me. <laughs> There's another Gus out there who's just waiting for that cat food advert <laughs> with his country music, with his old school Taylor yeah. Swift jams. And yeah, unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's hit the wrong one. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's a thing, yeah. Um, what for you is at this point in time the most insidious invasion of of privacy that you see because there's there's a lot going on to the point where there are even stores now across the UK asking for uh like your handprint to to get in uh to to get into certain stores or the Amazon stores where they scan your face and uh the QR code life that we were kind of heading towards as well uh, there's a lot going on and this yeah, is a topic that question. could go for hours, but yeah, what for you yeah. is... Good question. I think the worst thing, just because I'm closest to it probably, and I see it so often, is the fact that people do not realise how much their phone is leaking data. I mean, we're literally just giving this stuff away and um, and it affects every single person every second of their day and night is these apps on the phones that you're not aware of what they're doing. Um, the biggest problem is the transparency of what's going on with your phone. I mean, you should, it's a device that you own, you've bought it outright. You should know what's going on with that phone. But the the, the problem is that nobody knows. And that's why we built Block. And I know it's a bit of a, you know, <laughs> of course I would say that because we built Block, but it really does, it really surprised me. I mean, today on my phone, if I check and see what's been going on, and I've probably had Block on most of the morning, um, I blocked 13,000 requests to wow. ad companies and trackers. That's today. On a busy day, it sometimes gets to up to over 100,000 requests by the end of the day. And that's just from day to day using my phone. And each app is doing its own thing. So when you say, if you look at one app in isolation, you might go, well, what's the problem? You know, they want they, they need to track something. They need to work out how well their app is, is working. And you could go, well, okay, fair enough. But if I've got 100 apps and they're all doing this all the time, all that data is being hoovered up and harvested and it's being turned into, like I said, the the sort of the AI companies love that stuff because you, can, you, you can't build any AI without data. So I just, that, that worries me a lot, but in, um, and, it, and it affects everybody. Um, but the debate that I saw recently was about age verification in shops and I know the company that built some of the age verification tech. Um, it doesn't actually capture your biometrics. What they've cleverly managed to do was translate a face that's captured into some numbers that were no more, no longer facial data, but they'd sort of transposed it into a way that they could then compare it on device without sending it off to a server to say what your age uh, what your what your age is within you know a more accurate than a human so um there was a big debate about that and i'd intended the debate to be about how every camera should be described in a way that we we can understand it a bit like nutrition data on food packets you know like how much fat and whatever you might have in in some food content 
Um, I really think that every camera should have that and it should be a, a legal requirement. If you've got a CCTV camera or you've got something else, it should actually describe the purpose, like a bit like a mini privacy policy. So I also think that privacy policies themselves are far too complicated and verbose, but there should be a summary at the top, a bit like in the UK, you've got something called a key facts summary that usually with any financial services product, it will give you the the really important stuff on a, on a one page. Everything else is for legal people to read and the small print, if you like. But the key facts about camera should be its purpose, what they're capturing, how long they're keeping it for, if they are keeping it for, and potentially who it's been audited by. And um, I think that's something that we really need to start to see because you otherwise we're just going around completely ignorant to what's actually going on. So the debate about age verification ended up being about whether or not this tech should be allowed. Um, and people were strongly rejecting it until they better understood what the tech was actually doing. It wasn't actually co capturing faces and storing them anywhere. It was doing a sort of in-memory assessment and no, with no data being stored or shared or anything like that. So in my mind, I think, well, that's OK. Um, but in some people's minds, they were like, well, actually, we're just encouraging this kind of march towards a surveillance like society. society. We accept it. You know, there's cameras everywhere. Yeah, just accept it. If you do no wrong, you know, you shouldn't have anything to worry about. Um, and unless we accompany these cameras with some sort of indication as to what they're doing, because no one's going to go into the shop and say, can I see your privacy policy? I mean, in fact, I'll tell you, what, I'm actually going to do that. I'll go into the shop and I'd say, I want to know, I want to read it. And I don't think they're going to have the answers. I don't think the checkout staff for them, because they won't really know what to what to say or do um but they should you know they should be able to give someone peace of mind and say it's okay this is what we're doing here are the details you can read more about it on our privacy policy um but i will next time i visit that supermarket i will actually intentionally use the self-checkout stores um self-checkout where you can where your where your face is being monitored um and i'll ask them all about it but they won't know and no one else in the shop will know. I'll probably have to speak to head office. And that's the problem, isn't it? The problem is people are not educated enough to understand whether or not these things present a uh, risk to their privacy or not. And again, that just to highlight the issue there with what you said about the camera at the self-checkout is, again, that data can be sold on. And there are cameras out there that can know who you are, even if you're let's say you're at the next BLM protest and you've got a balaclava on and you've got sunglasses on and a hat and everything you can to hide your face. They can tell who you are by your walking pattern. They can tell who you are by other details, such as the height that it gives, such as how hard you hit the ground on one leg and all of these crazy little things. And, and that's not even mentioning the IMSI catches that they have that sweep up all your mobile phone data as you're going across uh, in central London, for example. There are so many layers to the leaks that we have. Now, I suppose the next question is, what can we do to, to try to get around some of this? Because like you said, there's cookie fatigue. Uh, people don't care. They just want to get to the website that's going to give them the information that they need, or they just want to download the app that's going to do the easy thing for them. I've got a de-googled phone uh, with graphene os and it is a bit of a pain but i appreciate the fact that it's at least slightly more private you know it's giving me a little bit more peace of mind about what's going on on my phone there's no google framework services unless i want it there but i know people aren't going to do that because the maps aren't as good because you can't use your banking i can't scan my phone to pay for something all these little things people aren't going to do that so yeah, I mean, uh, I think that, that you know, the, the trade-off, I've got many different phones, actually, but um, I like to sort of to work out what's going on. And I've got a similar, I've got a custom build. I've got an, a native build as well. I've got a native Samsung phone um, because without understanding what these phones are doing, I can't understand what the risks and, and what, you know, what sort of tools we should be building. I think the, the problem still just comes back to education um, in the main and 
um, in a in a Facebook conversation about these cameras at the at the stop shop at the weekend. Um, hundreds of people commenting, I think, you know, saying, don't be so silly. If you're not doing anything wrong, don't worry about it. Um, the just in general, the, the biggest problem I think that we face, aside from big tech exploiting data, of course, they're going to do that. And for to, to manage that side of things, we're going to have to rely on the legal cases, on the lawyers, on, on people smarter than me, you know, trying to hold these large organizations to account. Um, and so far, the EU is trying to do that. Um, to a certain extent, but the big tech's been fined elsewhere uh, in the US, even which was it's it's great actually to see that US authorities are also taking this kind of seriously. So we have to rely on them for that. Um, but then when it comes to generally, what what are we supposed to? I just think there's not enough education about privacy, and it probably needs to start at grassroots level. It probably needs to start in the schools where people need to really understand that we are walking into this like we we are in a surveillance kind of society today but if you sound too much like you're wearing a tin hat people don't want to listen to you so you need to sort of strike the balance of helping people to make better decisions and i think it's carissa Veliz who says it very well in her book or she's written plenty about it she's got a great book called privacy is power fantastic and, book, yeah um, yeah it's great and and i think she said you know don't give in to this data economy without some resistance and it is a data economy. So this whole privacy act is all about data. Um, and so, you know, give people the tooling to make better decisions to protect themselves more. And in doing so, help to protect society more from, from these risks. Uh, and hopefully, eventually, we'll get there before the singularity and the, the robots take over. Fingers crossed. Uh, although sometimes they... they... I do believe they'll probably make some better decisions than us if we've let ourselves get to this point already. But yeah, we deserve it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you say, we're pretty much already there in a surveillance state. Um, I didn't read 1984 in school. I read 1984 in the last three years. And I feel like we are kind of there because the TV is watching us. Yeah, there's evidence that Samsung has been in court cases having to openly admit that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, our TVs are listening to what you're doing or your laptop's listening and watching what you're doing. Uh, there's that famous photo of Zuckerberg with tape over his mic and tape over the camera and all the rest of it. And if he's doing it, he kind of knows why he has to do it. But with these legal cases and relying on the, the laws being written in, I'm going to be honest, I've got no faith in that. And the reason being... Um, my last episode that just uh, was released was the one with John Kiriakou. He's the chap that blew the whistle from the CIA about the state-sponsored torture program that they had, the enhanced interrogation techniques. Despite the fact that enhanced interrogation was illegal, this was something that George Bush had signed off on. This was something that the CIA was happy to carry out, and they were doing extraordinary rendition and all the rest of it despite the fact that it was all illegal. And so far as many members of the Senate were aware, the Congress were aware, none of this was happening. It was only after the, the whistleblowing that then people saw, uh, oh, shit, yeah, we are. Oh, God, we, we are torturing people. How many people thought that was a good thing or a bad thing? God knows. But um, it, it's the same with the data privacy stuff. It's the same with the tech stuff because of the fact that they're funded by the intelligence services they they're getting black budget money from the cia it's uh, as i mentioned earlier in the podcast those are the guys that helped to push your amazons and your googles and ensure that they were the big players google maps was something that was uh american military data that they were given to start off their first uh google map service uh, Facebook was given part of their framework uh, by the CIA or Inkytel CIA. I... And then there's uh, Pokemon Go as well, which is a particularly interesting story. So everyone thinks it's about chasing, uh, got to catch them all. But actually, it was it was blatantly funded because they wanted to capture what everyone where everyone was going. It's a location. No. Yeah, for sure. It was it's a really interesting story. Um that all of that was spun out of the intelligence services. Mm. I, got I mean, it's sucked. not even in denial. It's not even like it's not. It's it's out there on the public web. I mean, it's really obvious where the de where where all this came from. And if you think that was all about catching them all, I mean, 
it, it, absolutely not. You know, it's about <sighs> capturing what everyone was doing. Oh, I'm so disappointed in Pokemon. Oh, God. <laughs> so I, I suppose all that to say, even if there's a court case, that's not stopping anyone realistically yeah, this is yeah i mean I, I i agree it's currently we we don't really have any better options uh, aside from building the tools that give us the information that we need to help us understand what's going on hence why we, we build things like block uh but then when it comes to you know i think that if the legislation made the executives accountable and it, if there were if they were criminally liable then i think that would change things so um until that happens uh we, we're kind of stuck i think it's it's very difficult to uh get legislation changed um but i think if the the execs were criminally liable then that that would definitely change i think it's only really uber who um their former chief information security officer um has been convicted uh but of uh I think it was mainly of of lying about some data breaches that had happened. Um, and I can't. I don't want to go into the, the details of that because I don't want to say the wrong thing. But certainly there have been there has been a criminal charge, um, and he has been convicted of um, some form. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what it was in relation to data breaches. But I think if the executives of an organisation and, and the ownership were criminally liable for these things then that would obviously get them to sit up and take notice because nobody wants to spend days behind bars. So um, unfortunately, until that happens, I think we're going to be stuck with the situation where we've got to rely on the legislation and people like Max Schrems and and um, from uh, None of Your Business, from Neub, who have been actively challenging on a legal basis the activities of big tech and successfully um and and that's been great to see this activist kind of approach uh but we you know we're, we're quite uh, we're, we're i think we're a long way away from companies complying um with all, with the full legislation i mean looking at apple for example that was for me a really it was a great example of how everybody is doing it and it would have been impossible for them to have uh, been exploiting data in this way if they really had a culture of privacy, if they really, really cared, it just wouldn't have gone through. It just couldn't have happened. So um, they're just saying they're, they're, they're private. They're, they're better than the others, but that doesn't mean that they're whiter than white. So um, basically, everybody's going to bend the rules and do what they possibly can to make as much money as they possibly can. With Apple, I think, I think they do have... Uh, a culture of privacy but only for themselves in in the sense that they want to keep their secrets a secret they don't want the people to find out actually the only privacy we care about is the privacy of our secrets kids <laughs> you ain't going to find out what we're really doing behind the scenes and it yeah and um, when they when they launched um ios version 14.5 they introduced changes which meant that people had to opt in to um to being tracked across apps, which, you know, great. On the surface, you go, this is great. So it's, it's a win for privacy and it is, but you know, there's no harm in uh, making changes to affect the competition, the competition being other big tech. So Facebook or Meta's stock price dropped by about 250 billion sure. um, shortly after that change. And they, they, they're, it's not the sole reason because there's other competition from the likes of TikTok and what have you, but um after that change, they, you know, this had a significant impact on their business and on their ad business and on the ability for them to make money out of advertisers. Um, so I think that was sort of March, April. I think it was whenever their Q1 results last year came out, they were attributing a significant uh, impact of that iOS change, which had happened a few months beforehand. And there's one other thing that both Apple and Android phones do. And that is, they have mapped out Wi-Fi everywhere they go. C could you maybe describe that as as one of the last little scary things? Because I know we're also getting on for time as well. As that, when I first heard about what's going on with Wi-Fi in my phone, I thought that was crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's not something that I'm. I mean, I'm I'm aware of what they're doing. So. Um... 
yeah, they they are collecting um, all the data about all the Wi-Fi hotspots and whatever else. And so that will mean that occasionally you'll come up against, uh, maybe not even occasionally, you'll come up with a Wi-Fi hotspot that has been recorded by somebody else that somebody else has known to be, well, this is actually an open Wi-Fi spot. So Google will know that, um, and Apple as well, I think they, they will know whether these hotspots, they'll know about these hotspots, basically. They'll know that people have connected to them before. They'll record that information. And uh, I can only imagine what the map must look like, because at any point, if you check what Wi-Fi networks are around you, you're going to see you know, five to 10 different networks or more um, collecting this information, collecting where people are authenticating from is all just adding to that massive data set of where people are. Um, and it's another thing to, you know, to harvest and to try and use to, um, to, you know, to, to influence people. Uh, and is this something that block is also, uh, working towards okay. limiting? Well, um, at the moment, so block works a bit like there's something called Pi hole, um, which happened, which is like a DNS sinkhole. What that means is every time you visit a website, you type in the website address and it goes off to a DNS server, which then tells you the IP address uh, and then you visit the IP address. So that's just how basic DNS works. And we've got about 420,000 domains that we've categorized into, you know, phishing domains or, um, or just tracking, just, I shouldn't say just phishing domains, tracking domains. You know ads and things like that and um and then we we stop people from being able to visit those so um that stops you from from a, a scam perspective if it's a phishing website you can't visit the website uh, but even as far as like there are i get contacted probably on a weekly basis by people who've been hacked and typically it's something like i'm i've been hacked on instagram can you help recover my account and usually it's a social engineering attempt by the hackers. Quite often it's somebody who will claim to be in trouble. They'll say, oh, I've been locked out of my account. Um, Instagram just want to confirm, want three of my friends to confirm uh, who I am. So most people go, okay, yeah, I'll help, you know. And what ends up, what they end up doing is they end up triggering a legitimate uh, password reset request to the victim who then shares that information with the hackers. So then the hackers compromise their account too. So this kind of social engineering um, effort happens and happens all the time. Meta don't want to know about it. I've raised it as a security bug, but they're, they're just not bothered. So what we do is we actually block the official password reset URL, even though it's a legitimate one, because if you are trying to reset your password, then we pop you up with a notification to say, well, hey, by the way, if you're being asked to reset your password by someone else, you will um you you are likely in currently uh being hacked by somebody or someone's currently attempting to compromise your account so we block some of those and we just tell people that if you are really trying to reset your password then that's okay you can kind of lift the block for five minutes while you complete that but the chances are you were um unwittingly being compromised at that time if you carried on visiting that website and sharing the information with the hacker so um in terms of that, that's kind of what we do with block is we just basically block bad things, stop bad things from happening on the phone. Um, when it comes to Wi-Fi side of things, even the difference between Android and Apple uh, from a networking perspective, which is the layer that we're sort of operating in at a network level, um, we can do a lot more with Android than we can with the iPhone. With the iPhone, we can only tell that your phone is doing this rather than particular apps. So then when it comes to other things like Wi-Fi, um, I think that's going to be even harder for us um, to manage on the iPhone, but it's possible. Um, but I see the, these immediate risks are really just in the, I mean, what I should have done is work out what it was at before. It was at 12.3. In the Since since I last looked at it, I've blocked about 500 ads and trackers on my phone and I wasn't touching it. you haven't it even there. been on it. Do you? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think those are the things that Yes, we have to be sensationalist about it because we have to get people to go, oh my God, I need to do something about this. Turning, you know, that's why I sometimes do uh, guinea pig myself into using a product or a service like a normal person would, not a privacy advocate, because I want to know what's actually happening. And if I don't, if, if I don't do that, then I can't, I can't tell the story about all these bad things happening um, that are undoubtedly happening to everybody else. So 
I think, yeah, that this is it's um the easiest thing for us to do um because we, we initially talked about revoke and that app was about recovering your data. That might take up to 30 days. It's not, you know, in where we're trying to fight for everybody's attention and their time to do something. Um that doesn't appeal to enough people. We know that, you know, it, it works as a service, but the average person isn't gonna be um you know, they, they they can understand the concept maybe of trying to recover your data from all these places using Revoke, but it's not the immediate dopamine hit that you really need to convince someone that something's going on right now to you. So that's why Block works a lot better. It's a much easier, um, uh, easier concept to tell people that your phone is leaking data right now. Most people yeah. go, yeah, but what? Can you do? Well, actually, we can do something. So we really, um, on, on with Block, anything that we can do to... Uh, to highlight to someone the direct and immediate impact of what's happening uh, we'll be doing so uh, a bit of a long way of answering with the, with the wi-fi it's a slightly less slightly less easy to explain to somebody very quickly um what what is dangerous about potentially joining all these other wi-fi networks um but it's a, you know we'll add it we'll add it to the backlog <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, something something to to look at there in future. I I find it phenomenal. You weren't even touching your phone, and it was just doing all these things in the background. Like at, yeah. at, 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 at least I don't know if you opened an app and then it came up with, "Hey, we just blocked five hundred things." Then you're like, "Okay, you, you were active on the device. It was by your say so trying to connect to the network, but this is just." The stuff happening yep. in the background that we'll never be aware of that uh, unless an app like that exists, like what you guys have created exists, like we'd have no idea of of the insanity that's that's happening there. But um have you got any last little tidbits of wisdom that you'd like to impart onto the listeners on what they can do for themselves or how they can become better aware of what it is and why they should give a damn well i mean I, there's there are so there's multifaceted really isn't it there's so many things that you can do but the really simple ones are use a browser like brave brave is built on chrome so chromium engine um it works the same as chrome for most intents and purposes and that again is is fascinating to use on a let's say on a an ad funded newspaper website the probably the worst example is something like the daily mail in the uk i wouldn't recommend reading the content but i use it as an experiment to go onto their website with using brave and just notice how many ads and trackers are blocked um i mean it's 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 um it's horrendous so i would say use brave because that's that should be a choice that everyone can make fairly easily and you can use it across platforms mac uh, windows android iphone um that's a very simple one and it will stop a lot of these things from happening um, in terms of your browsing activities and habits. Obviously, I'd say, you know, try out Block because that will give you even more insight as to what's going on. Um, and then the search engines as well. So a couple of search engines that I'd recommend, well, probably Brave has its own search engine, which works quite well. Um, I just try and avoid using the big tech services where I can, like the Googles of this world. Hmm. Okay, fantastic. And where can people find you if they want to see what you're doing and and uh, what you're up to? Are you on any uh, social medias I, or anything? Yeah, I mean, I have. <laughs> I think I mentioned earlier about um, the addictive nature of uh, some of the social media platforms. Um, I, I am on Twitter at Gus Fraser. I am on LinkedIn. You should be able to find me there as well. Um, in fact, LinkedIn is where I'm getting most, where, where I generally post about this kind of content, um, finding that the audience is, um, uh, is, is receptive and there are great conversations and some very smart people contributing. I had the Information Commissioner responding to some of the comments about cameras uh, recently. And, you know, it's great. There's some, some very smart people who really care about this kind of stuff from lawyers to techs and techies and stuff like that. So um, LinkedIn is really where I, I, I generally post on you know, a few times a week uh, about this kind of content. Okay, fantastic. Well, look, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Annie.